The Lives of the Saints by Father Alban Butler, March 28th, St. John Capistrano. Capistrano is a small village in Abruzzo, once part of the Kingdom of Naples. There, in the 14th century, a certain soldier, it is debated whether of French or German origin, had settled, after fulfilling his military service, under the orders of Louis I. He married an Italian woman, and from this union was born, in 1386, a son named John, who was destined to acquire fame as one of the great luminaries of the Franciscan order. From his childhood, the boy was remarkable for his advancement. He studied law in Perugia with such success that, in 1412, he was appointed governor of the city and married the daughter of one of the leading citizens. During the hostilities between Perugia and the Malatesta, he was taken prisoner, and on this occasion he decided to change his way of life and become a religious. How he managed to solve the problem of his marriage is not entirely clear. But it is said that he crossed Perugia, riding backwards on a donkey and wearing a huge paper hat on which his worst sins were clearly written. He was stoned by the boys and covered with filth, and in this condition he presented himself to the novitiate of the friar's minor, asking for admission. At that time, 1416, he was thirty years old, and it seems that his novice master thought that for a man of such strength of will, who had been accustomed to do everything his own way, a harsh discipline was necessary to test the sincerity of his vocation. John had not yet made his first communion. The trials to which he was subjected were most humiliating and, on some occasions, were followed by supernatural manifestations. But Brother John persevered and, years later, often expressed his gratitude to the relentless instructor who made him understand that self-denial was the only sure path to perfection. In 1420, John was elevated to the priestly dignity. In the meantime, he made extraordinary progress in his studies while leading a life of extreme austerity. He traveled the roads barefoot. He devoted only three or four hours to sleep and wore a rough bristle shirt all the time. In his studies, he had St. James of the Mark as his companion and St. Bernardine of Siena as his teacher, to whom he had the deepest affection and veneration. Soon, the exceptional oratorical gifts of John became known, because Italy at that time was going through a terrible crisis of political unrest and relaxation of customs. These difficulties were caused, or at least accentuated, by the fact that there were three rivals claiming the papacy, and by the bitter antagonism between Guelphs and Ghibellines, which still persisted. In spite of all this, in his preaching throughout the peninsula, John found wonderful responses. There is, no doubt, a note of exaggeration in the terms in which Fathers Christopher of Verice and Nicholas of Ferra describe the effect produced by his discourses. They speak of 100,000 and even 150,000 listeners hearing each sermon. That was certainly not possible in a country decimated by wars, famines, and plagues, and because of the scarce means of communication at that time. But there was enough reason to justify the enthusiasm of the aforementioned writer when he tells us there was no one so anxious as John Capistrano for the conversion of heretics, schismatics, and Jews. No one so longed that his religion should flourish or that it should have greater power to work wonders. There was no one who so ardently desired martyrdom nor so famous for his sanctity, and so he was received with honor in all the provinces of Italy. The influx of people to his sermons was so great that it made one think that the apostolic times had returned. When he arrived in the provinces, the towns and villages were moved, and great crowds came to hear him. The towns invited him to visit them, either by means of urgent letters, or by means of messengers, or by appealing to the sovereign pontiff through influential persons. But what principally absorbed all the saints' attention was the work of preaching and the conversion of souls. There is no occasion to refer here in detail to the domestic difficulties that burdened the Order of St. Francis after the death of its seraphic founder. Suffice it to say that the group known as the Spirituals had by no means the same views regarding religious observance as those who were called relaxed. The reform of the observance, which had been begun in the middle of the 14th century, was still obstructed in many ways by the administration of general superiors who held a different kind of perfection. And, on the other hand, there were also exaggerations in the direction of a more severe austerity, which eventually culminated in the heretical teachings of the Fraticelli. All these difficulties called for a settlement, and Capistrano, working in harmony with St. Bernardine of Siena, was called upon to bear much of this heavy burden. After the general chapter, held at Assisi in 1430, 
St. John was appointed to draw the conclusions arrived at by the assembly, and these Martinian statutes, as they were called, by virtue of their confirmation by Pope Martin VI, are among the most important in the history of the order. Again, on several other occasions, the Holy See entrusted John with inquisitorial powers, as, for example, to proceed against the Fraticelli and to investigate the grave accusation made against the Jesuit order founded by Blessed John Columbanus. Later, he was deeply interested in the reform of the Franciscan nuns, who owed their main inspiration to St. Coletta, as well as to the tertiaries of the order. At the Council of Ferrara, later transferred to Florence, he was listened to attentively, but between the first and the last sessions, he was obliged to visit Jerusalem as apostolic commissary. Incidentally, he had contributed much to the inclusion of the Armenians in the settlement with the Greeks, unfortunately of short duration, which was to take effect in Florence. When Emperor Frederick III, finding that the religious G uh, countries under his sovereignty were suffering grievously from the activities of Yas Hussite and other heretical sectarians, he appealed to Pope Nicholas V for help, and St. John Capitranus was sent as commissary and inquisitor general, and left for Vienna in 1451 with twelve of his Franciscan brethren to assist him. It is beyond doubt that their arrival produced a great sensation. Silvio Aeneas, the future Pope Pius II, tells us how, upon entering Austrian territory, the priests and the people came out to greet him, carrying the sacred relics. They greeted him as a legacy of the apostolic see, as a preacher of the truth, and as a great prophet sent by God. They came down from the mountains to greet John, as if Peter or Paul or one of the other apostles were the one to arrive. They gladly kissed the hem of his garment, presented their sick and afflicted to him, and it is said that many were healed. The important people of the city came out to meet him and led him to Vienna. There was no square that could contain the crowds. They all looked upon him as an angel of God. John's work as an inquisitor and his dealings with the Hussites and other Bohemian heretics has been severely criticized, but this is not the place to attempt any justification. His zeal was cauterizing and consuming, though he was merciful to the humble and repentant. He was ahead of his time in his attitude toward witchcraft and the use of torture. The miracles that accompanied him wherever he went, and which he attributed to the relics of St. Bernardine de Seine, were assiduously observed by his companions. Later, a prejudice arose against the saint because of the accounts that were published about these wonders. He traveled from place to place, preaching in Bavaria, Saxony, and Poland, and his efforts were everywhere, accompanied by a great revival of faith and devotion. Cochleo of Nuremberg tells us that those who saw him there describe him as a small-bodied man, wiry, worn out, and with his skin sticking to the bone, but enthusiastic, strong, and assiduous in his work. He slept in his habit and rose before dawn, recited his office, and then celebrated Mass. After that, he would preach in Latin, which was then translated to the people by an interpreter. He would also visit the sick who were awaiting his arrival, laying his hands on their heads, praying and touching them with one of the relics of St. Bernardine. The fall of Constantinople to the Turks put an end to this spiritual campaign. Capistrano was called upon to encourage the defenders of the West and to preach a crusade against the infidels. His early efforts in Bavaria and even in Austria met with little response, and early in 1456 the situation became desperate. The Turks were advancing to besiege Belgrade and the saint, who by this time had traveled to Hungary, meeting in council with the great general Huniades, saw clearly that they would have to rely mainly on local effort. St. John personally exhausted himself preaching and exhorting the Hungarian people to raise an army that could meet the threatening danger, and he himself led to Belgrade more troops than he had been able to recruit. Very soon, the Turks were barricaded and the siege began. Encouraged by Capistrano's prayers and his heroic example on the battlefield and suitably guided by Huniades' military experience, the garrison soldiers at last won an overwhelming victory. The siege was abandoned and Western Europe was spared temporarily, but the putrefaction of thousands of corpses left unburied around the city caused an epidemic that cost the life, first of all, of Huniades, and then, a month or two later, of Capistrano himself, exhausted by years of toil and austerities, and by the hardships of the siege. He died peacefully in Villach, October 23, 1456, and was canonized in 1724. His feast day became general in 1890 for the entire Western Church, and was then transferred to March 28th. 